Um, again, you know, I just want to thank everyone for being here. I know this is a very exciting topic for myself. But I hope that everyone else shares that level of enthusiasm. We will be uh, going through different aspects of mega projects. I've been involved with several different mega projects on the, the, the commercial, of the shipping, on the construction side. I find that all of them are quite different and unique. Um, but most of all, I find that you get some great new knowledge and new experience from each one. We will be going through some of them um, that are a little bit more uh, publicly available as well as some from my own personal experience. So I, I do want to uh, let everyone know, uh, please, if you have questions, uh, write them down, put them in at the end. I'm very excited to answer any and all that you have, even if they don't even pertain this show to the presentation. Um, I feel that there's a lot of value in exchanging information and knowledge. Just to kind of rapidly go through the agenda here, um, we're, we're going through the brief introduction now. We will talk a little bit about complexity theory. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that some of you are familiar with this. If not, you'll uh, pick up a little bit there. We will talk about uh, virtual mega projects uh, as a whole and then talk about some uh, successes and, and failures when it comes to mega projects. And then we'll kind of go into uh, some elements that I feel that are, are necessary to uh, to go through uh, for any mega project, meaning these are going to be some tools and knowledge uh, that you can utilize when it comes to any uh, mega project or virtual mega project. Uh, so I feel that everyone will get a lot out of all those points, and then we'll end with questions and answers. Okay. All right. To start, you know, uh, complexity theory uh, was born out of chaos theory. Um, basically, chaos theory is that, you know, uh, not necessarily knowing all the variables of any particular uh, situation um, can lead to uh, disorder. However, uh, there is sometimes uh, certain orders that can be uh, delved, uh, can be derived from that. Uh, one of the elements that we, we use as an example would be the weather. Uh, we are getting very good with satellites and information to predict the weather. However, we do not have it with 100% accuracy, even though we understand the movement of wind, uh, the, the temperature of, of the location, the, uh, the other, other elements that are occurring. What happens is uh, complexity theory, how it applies to uh, project management, is that oftentimes uh, project managers believe in just having linear thinking, meaning they're just looking at a project timeline and they feel that everything uh, will lead to one item leads to the next, which leads to the next. Uh, so what you end up happening, what you end up getting is a very linear view of a project. Well, what happens is, and we'll see in a mega project, everything's happening at once. A lot of elements are happening all at once. <clears throat> and trying to put that on a timeline and trying to put it in a linear concept of A, going to B, going to C, doesn't always work. And what happens is, um, you know, as people, <clears throat> we want order. We feel that if, if things are in, in the appropriate buckets and the appropriate shelves and the appropriate categories, we feel that we have control. What ends up happening is with a, with a large virtual mega project is that control becomes a little bit more of an abstract feeling or an abstract view because you don't necessarily have control of every single element within the organization, within the project. You may be uh, managing your project team and they may be managing their, their team and subcontractors, but you really don't have as much control as you would like. And this is somewhat disconcerting to some project managers because they are, are unwilling to let go. They don't necessarily uh, see the, the, the value in allowing people to, to, to do things on their own. They feel that if they're not giving people direction, they aren't truly managing. Well, we'll, we'll find out and as we go along in this presentation that uh, that's not always the case. Uh, to some degree, a manager has to let go, has to delegate, has to be able to uh, intervene when necessary, but one can't be everywhere all the time. So uh, one needs to kind of learn to deal with this kind of chaos that people feel. And uh, with that, uh, a project manager has to allow people within the project, the mega project, to actually handle things on their own, meaning have people that are closest to the problem solve the problems. Now, sometimes that bothers people because they feel in a traditional project manager role, they feel that if people aren't coming to them with the problems, they can't fix them. Well, that may be true, but if they're getting fixed at the, at the level where they're happening, then the project manager can focus on other things that are important uh, for the mega project, and we'll talk about that a little bit later as well. Okay? Um, virtual project management, I wanted to touch on this because virtual projects are just 
far more complex. You know, once again, once you're dealing with virtual projects, you have people in different time zones, in different countries, in different areas, in different project sites. Um, and so now you're dealing with, one, a need for technology because it, you need to have technology to connect everyone. Uh, once again, you're going to be on the phone, you're going to be using the fax machine, you're going to be using email, you're going to be using social media, you're going to be, you know, using uh, text, whatever is necessary, but you're going to need technology to stay in touch. And uh, to that degree, it's an important thing to have and to make sure that everyone has. Um, you also need to, to, to have better communication, better meaning more efficient. Meaning as a project manager, you're going to need to be able to communicate with your team in an effective and efficient manner because there's so much going on and so much that needs to be monitored that it's necessary to uh, have communication that not only flows to the project team but from the project team. Okay? Um, once again, experience is important. Um, you're, you're going to find that experienced project managers are going to deal with the virtual environment better. They're better equipped, and they understand uh, delegation and trust. And I kind of want to touch on trust a little bit here um, because it is so important. What happens is I have seen projects succeed uh, because of trust, and I've seen projects fail because of trust. Uh, what ends up happening is if people trust the project manager, the project team, the organization, that it will be successful, I, I find that it's more likely to be successful. I find that projects, when they, when people start pulling away or feeling that they don't trust what they're being told or they feel that they're being told misinformation, then people aren't going to try as hard. They aren't going to be fully committed to the uh, organization of project, and they're likely going to be looking to go somewhere else where they do feel valued and trusted. So it's important to, to keep that level of trust in a project, in a project team, in a project manager, uh, in order to be successful. Now, having said all this, you know, what, what does this mean to, to project managers? You know, project managers need to understand that, uh, you know, uh, you can't, even though complexity allows for a degree of, uh, uh, people to, to do what they need to do as professionals, to solve their own problems, to work out their, their own situations, it doesn't mean that it's a free-for-all. You know, I, I feel that sometimes some managers say, well, if I, if I stop managing my team, they're just going to do what they want and not get everything done. And, I, and I, I mostly disagree with that statement because I feel that most of the time, you know, you pick the team that's good and you're working with the team that's good. And if they're good, they should be able to take care of these things and, and help you as the project manager. If they aren't good, you need to, to, to cut loose and sever the ties with them. And it sounds harsh. But I have found projects, you know, project managers say, well, you know, this person has experience and knowledgeable, but if they aren't on the team, it's just not going to work. And if they aren't looking out for the, the project's best interest and the company's best interest and they're only looking for their best interest, I'll guarantee at the end of the project they're going to end up looking good and the project's going to end up looking bad. So keep that in mind. You know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a tough thing to accept, but you have to, uh, again, understand that, you know, Good people need to be rewarded and taken care of and trusted and people that, that aren't performing. And it doesn't mean they're bad people. It just means that, hey, they just aren't in that project uh, to win it. So they have to, you know, you have to kind of work with that. Um, kind of touching now into the virtual mega projects uh, that have existed and have happened and that hit the media. Um, one of them I want to talk about was uh, on 9-11. Um, once again, we, we're all familiar with what happened and, and the, the chain of events there. But what ended up occurring was uh, the FAA was called you know, by the president to say, look, you've got to land every single plane that's in the air in our airspace, period. At that point, the FAA didn't really have a plan for this. There was, there was no contingency that someone went around and said, well, you know, if we ever needed to land every plane in America, how would we do it? Well, what ended up happening was they did what they could. They basically, you know, put the word out and contacted every, you know, control tower.